it's working. Okay. It's working. Okay, so do we start? Do we wait a minute? Yeah, let's wait for a minute. Well, okay, I think it's time to start. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second plenary session of CMD 2020 Jefes. I hope that you are all enjoying the meetings. I am Maria Jose Calderon from the Institute of Material Science in Madrid, and I will be chairing the session. It's an honor for me to introduce our plenary speaker, Professor Beatriz Noeda from the University of Groningen, where she chairs the nanostructures of a fundamental oxides group at the Cernike Institute for Advanced Materials and is the founding director of the Groningen Cognitive Systems and Materials Center. Professor Noeta did her PhD at Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, where this uh, conference should have taken place, and held various positions at Southern University, Clarendon Laboratory in Oxford, VU Amsterdam, and Brookhaven National Lab, before arriving in Groningen with a Rosalind Franklin Fellowship back in 2004. Uh, Noeda is a fellow of the American Physical Society, and is recipient of the IEEE Robert Newman Ferroelectrics Award. She's certainly a reference in this field, so we are looking forward to hear about the properties of hafnia-based ferroelectric devices, which is the topic of her talk today. Beatriz, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Maria Jose, and uh, to all the organizers for giving me this fantastic opportunity to be here in Madrid. <laughs> And, uh, and in this fantastic meeting and uh, in front of so many people, also outside the field of fer ferroelectrics. So I hope I can bring a little bit of uh, information to those who have been far from ferroelectrics uh, during, uh, during uh, in their careers. Um, so I um, will start uh, with the most important information. Uh, before you all lose attention, is presenting the people who have actually done uh, the work and without whom I wouldn't be here. Um, I have a fantastic team and uh, among this fantastic team, there are these people you, you see here that have been working on uh, the topic that I'm going to present today, which is ferroelectric hafnia. And I would like to emphasize the contributions of Infen Bay. Uh, who has been a PhD and a postdoc in my group for the past uh, five years and has done a, a lot of what I'm going to present here, uh, especially on the growth of the films and the electrical characterization and the tunnel junction devices. Pavan Nukala, uh, he has done uh, uh, all the microscopy you're going to see uh, and also contributed uh, to various aspects. And also Mart Salverda, Jordi Antoya, Leonard, uh, Cynthia Quinteros and uh, master students Vincent De Haas and Eugenius Stylianidis. It's also very nice to see very young and very motivated people. Um, uh, there are also uh, other collaborators. Actually, uh, I didn't put here the whole list, and I, I want to emphasize uh, three people who have been uh, really instrumental for uh, most of the results that I, I will present here, which is. Sylvia Madsen and uh, her team at the University of Paris Sud. Uh, she has been uh, fabricating the tunnel junctions that I will uh, discuss today. Uh, and Jorge Iniguez and Hongian Zhao at uh, the Luxembourg Institute of Technology who have contributed with a lot of insights and uh, first principles calculations. I will not say a lot about that today mm -hmm. because of time constraints, but uh, they have been in the background helping enormously. Okay, so let me tell you first why uh, ferroelectric hafnia-based films, films are so important. And uh, for that, I, I need to, to go back to ferroelectric memories. And you may be surprised to hear that ferroelectric memories are actually the first semiconducting memories that were invented. Uh, they were invented in 1955 uh, during the PhD thesis of Dadol uh, back in MIT. 
And this I discovered myself really very recently uh, in this blog here, the memory guide blog. So I, I also advise you to go there because it's really interesting. Uh, and this, what you see here, is a cover of the September 1955 issue of the Bell Laboratories record, where it shows a ferroelectric crystal here in the middle with uh, the arrays, all these electrodes, uh, crossing uh, crossbar electrodes showing a 256 bit uh, ferroelectric memory in uh, 1955. Um, so it is actually 68 years of ferroelectric memories that we are talking about. Um, as you probably know, and the, the basic mechanism for the memory effect is the fact that the ferroelectrics have a spontaneous polarization that you can switch between two states, up polarized or down polarized. Uh, ferroelectrics have uh, permanent polarization, so spontaneous dipoles. And as you can see, compared to a normal dielectric, they show very highly nonlinear and hysteretic polarization versus electric field loops. Um, so ferroelectric memories have been around a long time and uh, some of the parents of the, the fathers of, of ferroelectric memories, uh, one could say that there are James Scott and uh, Carlos Paz de Araujo uh, in this uh, uh, paper from 1989, they, um, they, they set the perspectives for ferroelectric memories uh, and they mention here, as you can read, that they combine very high speed, 30 nanosecond read arrays and read write operation, uh, five volts standard silicon uh, logic levels, very high densities at that time, two by two micrometer cell size, complete non volatility and extreme radiation hardness. And um, at that time, they were talking about uh, films that were lead containing or bismuth containing and were like 100 to 300 nanometers thick. And remember, it was 1989. Um, so, indeed, ferroelectric memories are very interesting because they are non-volatile RAM memories, they have a very short access times, very long retention, and uh, nowadays very good endurance, like uh, 10 to the 16 cycles, with very low power writing um, needed. Um, I actually would like to advertise this paper by, the, by Tony Schenk and the group in uh, NumLab, where uh, they really uh, review very nicely uh, the di different types of memories and, and they explain memory in a, in a way that material scientists uh, can understand really well. Um, but uh, the problem at that time was that these very nice memories, they uh, contain the materials in, in these ferroelectrics, they were either containing lead or bismuth, which, uh, which are highly volatile. And that at that time made the, uh, the CMOS process really expensive. Um, so the, sec the second problem was miniaturization in ferroelectrics. Miniaturization was uh, problematic and uh, around 2004, uh, five or so, the, the, the limit of miniaturization of ferroelectric cells was about uh, 19 nanometers. That's why ferroelectric memories stayed in the way and didn't make it further. Um, they were used and they have been used in, in applications that need a really low density memory, like the PlayStation or the, the identification cards that uh, people use in, uh, in Japan and other countries to go into uh, public transportation, for example. Um, but not to computers. And the main problem was indeed the issues uh, with respect to miniaturization. Because if you make ferroelectrics uh, nano-sized, um, ferroelectrics really need to fight against polarization discontinuities. Um, if the ferroelectric is very small, most of the permanent dipoles are at the surface. And as you know from Maxwell laws, uh, polarization discontinuities are um, not uh, favorable. So the material will generate a depolarization field that, that tries to kill the polarization. And this is very well known in also in ferromagnets, for example, that gives rise to stripe domains, or in this case, as you see here, closure domains of vortices and other exotic uh, defects that um, create a, 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 a zero net polarization and, and avoids uh, the polarization fields. But at the end of the day, what you, what you have is that the very small ferroelectric doesn't maintain the memory. Um, as, as explained in, the, in this uh, uh, classical paper by Javier Junquera and Philippe Gosses, 
Um, of course, a way to solve this problem would be, uh, you could think it could be to, to electrode your, uh, your photoelectric, and because the, the electrons in the metal will screen the polarization charges, you uh, expect that, that these depolarization effects will not be there, but that's actually not true, because there's no, uh, in real life, there's no perfect uh, um, um, metal that can screen perfectly the polarization charges. So there is always a depolarization field, and this depolarization field, as you can see here, this is a ferroelectric. This is a ferroelectric layer in, in between two electrodes, and uh, on top you see the charge density, and you can see it is not fully screened uh, at the interfaces with the electrodes, which gives rise to a, a potential at the interface that, at the end, will give rise to a field and the depolarization field that depends inversely on the thickness of the, the film. That's why very thin films, when you try to make ferroelectrics really small, will have a very large depolarization field that will kill the polarization. So in short, miniaturization of ferroelectrics is, is a, an intrinsic challenge, or we thought it was an intrinsic challenge. And that's why uh, the application of ferroelectric memories was uh, kind of uh, stuck. That's why uh, there was a big, big surprise to see that um, the group of uh, NAMLAB, together with uh, some, some people in, in, in Aachen, um, uh, reported in 2011 that actually hafnia, the simple material hafnia, was ferroelectric at the nanoscale. So not only is uh, surprising that hafnia is ferroelectric, but it's even more surprising that it's ferroelectric only when it's actually nano-sized. So uh, as you can imagine, in the ferroelectrics field, most of the people were skeptical, and it took us uh, several years to actually take uh, these results seriously. But many groups have uh, later on reported uh, similar results, and uh, at some point, we had to pay attention to, uh, to this uh, very interesting material. So let me first go and introduce a little bit about hafnia and uh, zirconia, which is actually uh, very similar to hafnia. Actually, zirconia and hafnia, they have uh, not only the same valence, but also the same radion, uh, ionic radius. So materials, crystals of hafnia and zirconia have very similar unit cell volumes, and uh, they look very similar in many uh, aspects. And uh, they are very well known in the semiconductor field because they have been uh, used as a substitution of silicon oxide as gate oxides and, um, uh, and insulators. And you can see here in this diagram band gap versus uh, the electric permittivity. And you can see that zirconia and hafnia are located in a very nice position, uh, uh, relatively large band gap and relatively large the electric permittivity. That's why they have been preferred in many applications. And you can see here in this example, the capacitors uh, uh, using a one nanometer oxide layer of hafnia um, that is showing a high K, low leakage, low loss, uh, and uh, perfect conformality because they, they can be grown uh, using ALD or, or CSD uh, methods. So they have been used and they, they are uh, integrated into the CMOS process, uh, which is, of course, uh, a huge advantage. Um, so, so why, why um, uh, uh, people at NAMLAB started noticing that uh, Hafnia could be ferroelectric at the nanoscale? Well, because they found a peak in the, in the capacitance versus uh, uh, voltage of field uh, curve that was very much similar to, to what you would uh, uh, see in a, in a ferroelectric material. And they realized that this peak in the capacitance uh, voltage uh, characteristics was only there when the material was capped with an electrode and crystallized. So if, if the material was not confined between electrodes and it was not, crystal, or it was not crystalline, this peak was not there. So looking more closely to these films, when you, you have to realize these films were very, very thin because they are, these are the typical thicknesses that one uses in microelectronics. Also, uh, any structural characterization is enormously challenging. So you cannot really look at the atomic structure in detail. You can look maybe at the total symmetry. You can compare one phase with the other, but you cannot really say a lot about the exact atomic positions. But, but you could see from a powder diffraction um, uh, a spectra that, uh, pattern that, that indeed the 
the two uh, the the two uh, films were quite different, and, and they could associate uh, the cap film film with uh, an orthorhombic phase that had been previously reported to be polar in zirconia. So since that moment on, uh, when people see ferroelectricity or uh, ferroelectric switching peaks in hafnia, um, this is assumed to be an orthorhombic polar phase that is known in hafnia. Um, indeed, when one uh, looks carefully at these films, you can see a very nice ferroelectric polarization switching loops. And these are films of thicknesses between uh, 7 and 10 nanometers. And this ferroelectricity depends very much on many different uh, uh, things. For example, on doping. Uh, pure hafnia uh, doesn't show ferroelectricity. You have to dope it a little bit with silicon and many other dopants also work. If you dope it too much, it becomes, uh, you, you, you destroy the ferroelectricity. So there were a lot of questions about what are exactly the, the, the factors that determine the appearance of ferroelectricity in, in these materials. And um, after a lot of uh, work by many different groups, it was clearly demonstrated that, that in order to uh, achieve this uh, ferroelectric phase, one needs to start uh, nucleating or, or stabilizing the tetragonal phase of hafnia. And that if one uh, goes to the, to the um, ground, the state of the material, which is a monoclinic phase, uh, is not possible to reach this ferroelectric phase. Uh, so there is a, a transformation needed from a tetragonal phase to uh, uh, this orthorhombic ferroelectric phase in, in hafnia. And in some cases, this could happen during capping or confining the material. In some cases, during doping. In some cases, you needed both. Um, at some point, it was all a little bit confusing at the beginning. Um, but more and more things were, uh, were being learned about the material. For example, indeed, it was known that zirconia and hafnia have a martensitic phase transition at, at high temperatures that involve a huge reduction in volume. So the ground state monoclinic phase has a larger volume than the high temperature tetragonal phase above the martensitic transition. And it happened that this orthorhombic phase that was stabilized in these very thin films seemed to be an intermediate phase between the tetragonal and the uh, uh, monoclinic phase. So the route towards stabilizing the orthorhombic phase seemed to be uh, trying to get the tetragonal material and then changing um, either doping or uh, different um, aspects that we'll see later in order to go into the orthorhombic phase. If one would stabilize the, the monoclinic phase originally, um, this uh, energy minimum is too deep to be able to later go into the orthorhombic ferroelectric phase. So all this, of course, took many years, several years to figure out all these details. But it was clear uh, that in order to stabilize this ferroelectric phase, one needed uh, a small sizes. Uh, hafnia, bulk hafnia, bulk zirconia are not ferroelectric. They are known for many years and uh, no, no sign of ferroelectricity has been um, seen of them. And this, this was one of the, of the mysteries of the material. Why is suddenly at the nanoscale hafnia becoming ferroelectric? And the answer to that is actually in, in the surface energy. Um, so it is possible by, um, by in, uh, reducing the size of the material to increase the surface energy contribution such that uh, the phase stability changes. And this is actually known for a long time already that one can go from the monoclinic phase to the tetragonal phase by reducing the size of hafnia or zirconia. Um, so large grains, will we'll have uh, the ground state uh, monoclinic phase, while small grains can, can actually cross over to uh, uh, the stability of the tetragonal phase. And, and this is well known in, in nanoparticles as if you reduce the size uh, enough to create enough uh, surface energy, then the, 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 there is an, uh, an inter a huge internal pressure induced in the middle of the particle that is inversely proportional to the size of the particle, to the radius of the particle. And these internal pressures can reach uh, of the order of, of several gigapascals. So they can really change the stability of phases in, in this material. Uh, so indeed, it seems like one can go to this high temperature tetragonal phase by reducing the and that's why the, the polar phase of hafnia was only found at a really low, low thickness or low sizes. Um, now, uh, 
soon it, it was found that uh, not only doped hafnia was interesting, but actually a particular composition with uh, uh, hafnium oxide and zirconium oxide uh, mixed in equal, uh, uh, equal, equal ratios uh, was actually very interesting and maybe better than, than hafnia. And that was also another question, why is that? Why this particular composition happens to be uh, very good? And, and this also had to do with the size uh, effect. Um, as we just discussed, the, the surface contribution to the free energy is very important. And, and calculations demonstrated that in pure hafnia, this uh, surface contribution can stabilize the ferroelectric phase, which is this uh, red lines, dashed lines here, in between three nanometers and five nanometers. So you can see how, uh, how tricky all this is. You really have to be on a particular size to stabilize this ferroelectric phase. And these people at NAMLAB, they were lucky enough to actually get in there. Of course, if you put in some dopants and you put some pressure during capping, you can elongate this stability a little bit more. And this is probably what happened to them too. Now, interestingly, if you go to pure zirconia, as I said, zirconia and hafnia have the same balance, they have the, the, the same ionic radius, but actually uh, they are different, of course. And uh, the, the main difference between them is actually in the surface energy. So you can see that um, in, in uh, zirconia, the, uh, the ferroelectric phase is never the ground state. So uh, one cannot get uh, pure zirconia ferroelectric, but actually you can mix the two of them. And you can see that by mixing zirconia and hafnia 50-50, you can uh, increase the stability of the ferroelectric phase to larger radius. And this is uh, very important, of course, for applications that you can uh, go to a little bit higher uh, uh, thicknesses. OK. So, uh, so it's interesting because, as I said, uh, zirconia is not ferroelectric, but you can stabilize it in a tetragonal phase, which is antipolar, it's anti-ferroelectric, and you can induce, one can induce from pure zirconia uh, the polar phase by applying an electric field through a first-order phase transition. And this was first uh, proposed by first principles calculations in this paper here. So it is possible to induce the ferroelectric phase um, uh, from an antiferroelectric phase applying an electric field. It is also possible, according to calculations, to create a, the polar phase or to induce the polar phase uh, even without considering size effects. By applying enough strain to the material and an electric field, a combination of both of them can induce the ferroelectric phase even in large enough materials, according to the calculations. This actually consi is consistent with, what some, with something that people have seen in, in these materials, which is what, uh, what we call a wake-up effect. You make your material, your material is not ferroelectric originally, but, uh, but uh, it, it becomes ferroelectric after a lot of cycles. And this is what this uh, was called a wake-up effect is needed. And this seems to be uh, pointing in this direction. You may need to apply some electric field cycling in, in order to, to create this ferroelectric phase. As I said, uh, many of, the, of these uh, effects are very tricky, very subtle, and it took very long time to understand why all this doping and strain and electric field and, and size, how exactly they, they affect, uh, affect the material. And uh, I recommend you look at this book where everything is explained. It's the holy book of ferroelectric hafnia here. So in short, uh, to, to, to summarize the introduction, the orthorhombic ferroelectric phase is an intermediate state between the monoclinic and the tetragonal phases that are well known in, in hafnia. Stabilizing this ferroelectric phase is not possible if one starts from the ground state, so you have to find tricks like size reduction or doping or strain to go into the tetragonal phase or directly into this orthorhombic phase. And at room temperature, zirconia is closer to this tetragonal phase than hafnia. And, and therefore, zirconia will need less doping, less size reduction, or less strain to, to get into the, uh, into the tetragonal phase. But uh, on the other hand, it needs to, an electric field to stabilize the orthorhombic phase. OK, so many, we, uh, in, in the meantime, we have understood a lot of things about the st uh, stabilizing this, uh, this nonpolar phase. So now we believe that indeed it is possible that the material that is not ferroelectric in bulk becomes ferroelectric at the nanoscale. But, uh, but we still have a lot of questions. For example, can we make single phase films with the, these materials? Because at the moment, all the materials that were uh, crystallized in this way were not a single 
crystals, so they had this orthorhombic ferrotrip phase in combination or in coexistence with other nonpolar phases. So the, the functionality of the films were not, was not um, optimal. What is the actual atomic arrangement? Because these films are polycrystalline and, and mixed phase is very difficult and very, very thin. It's very difficult to actually uh, learn or do proper uh, structural characterization and look at this exact atomic arrangement. Can we decrease the switching field? These materials are, are, are known to have a coercive field, a switching field that is larger than, than the, those of, of the other classical ferroelectrics. And uh, first, we need to understand uh, how these materials switch in order to see if we can work on decreasing this switching field. And, and a, a very important question is why does it stay polar? It's OK that we have a polar phase of the nanoscale, but uh, we still have the problem of the depolarization field. Why in half near the depolarization field is not killing the, the, the ferroelectricity? Um, one answer to that question could be that uh, the dielectric permittivity of hafnia is much smaller than the permittivity of normal ferroelectrics, maybe one order of magnitude or, or two orders of magnitude even smaller. Um, and that's why maybe the effect of the polarization field is not so strong. But then the question is, why is the dielectric permittivity of hafnia so small? So there are still a lot of questions that need to be answered, and that's why one need, needs to go to better and better films, single phase films, and epitaxial growing films. And uh, this is work, uh, the first work on epitaxial thin films that were, was reported by uh, the group of, of Nakubo. Uh, and uh, it was very nice to see that if you, one makes single phase hafnia with no other coexisting phases, the, uh, the ferroelectric polarization that these films can uh, achieve is 40, more than 40 microcoulombs a square centimeter, which is better than a classical ferroelectric such as barium titanate. Um, because of single phase films, they could also measure the, the look at the order parameter as a function of temperature and extract an, an ordering temperature, which is very important to, to, to see that the material is an actual ferroelectric, which is uh, a little bit below 500 Celsius. Um, a bit textual grown uh, hafnia was also done in the group of uh, uh, Florencio Sanchez and uh, Pep Foncubert and the ICMAP, and they have grown materials uh, hafnia on different substrates and look at a very uh, important correlation between the polarization of hafnia and the strain, the pitaxial strain um, on the films. We also did that. We uh, grew, uh, grew uh, hafnia or hafnia zirconium oxide by pulse laser deposition um, on a completely different type of substrate, on, on perovskite substrate, um, and with a buffer layer or electrode of uh, lanthanum strontium manganite, trying to make devices with these materials. And um, we found uh, several surprises. So first of all, the materials, uh, when they are very thin, they are under a, a, a huge uh, compressive strain. You can see how the strain relaxes. This is an X-ray refraction pattern sh showing the strain relaxation of the, of the material. And they are pure uh, phase until uh, thicknesses of about 10 nanometers, where you can see the monoclinic phase, the ground state, non-ferroelectric, uh, non-polar phase appearing. But it's also interesting that uh, the, the diffraction peaks that we obtain are, were not exactly those as expected for the orthorhombic phase. Um, and we actually figure out that this was not an orthorhombic phase, it was actually a rhombohedral phase. So this is still a new phase, and, and this rhombohedral phase was, had been actually predicted by uh, calculations before, um, that is higher in energy than the orthorhombic phase, and still is accessible when the material goes, uh, is under high strain. And the very nice thing of this uh, ferroelectric phase is that, first of all, it has a very large ferroelectric polarization, but um, that can reach to 34 uh, microcoulomb square centimeter. And at the same time, it doesn't need a wake up cycling, it's as grown ferroelectric. Um, it also has a relatively large coercive field, even larger than those uh, films that are not epitaxial. And we wanted to understand why um, all this is. Um, so this, uh, this rhombohedral phase uh, happens to be not so strange and not so rare. Uh, we could also grow that in collaboration with the group in Twente by Huss, uh, with Huss Reinders and Nahar Jan Koster uh, on gallium nitrite. Uh, and in, on gallium nitrite, uh, we could actually grow a single phase uh, a rhombohedral 
um, um, uh, films that, that can be imaged very nicely by uh, electron microscopy and confirm that this phase is indeed not orthorhombic but a rhombohedral phase. Um, and it can also be grown nicely on silicon 111. So both in, in gallium nitride and silicon and also in sapphire, one can use the template, the, 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 uh, the symmetry of the substrate to grow this uh, rhombohedral phase. And uh, uh, actually to achieve quite a nice control. Um, in this way, uh, you can um, use in, 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 do in situ scavenging of the native uh, oxide layer that, that grows on top of the silicon. Um, the, the, the same hafnia material, zirconia and hafnia are, are scavenging the oxygen from the silicon and creating a crystalline silicon monolayer that is able to organize the hafnia in a very nice uh, rhombohedral manner. Um, this this uh, interface layer also provides the compressive strain that is needed to create this polar phase. Um, one can also grow directly on uh, hafnia on silicon 100, but in that case is the orthorhombic phase that, uh, that grows and it grows uh, in coexistence with a monoclinic phase. This has also been shown in the group of uh, Josep von Coberta. Um, in the ICMAP and others. And it has also been um, reported by the group of Sayef Salahuddin, um, the, the direct growth of um, the orthorhombic phase on silicon 100. So uh, by, by now we have very good control on, on these materials. And we uh, can, uh, in, in this paper, you can see that there are certain guidelines that can help you to stabilize the rhombohedral phase on different substrates. And we have seen that uh, you need a, a certain amount of strain uh, if you want to have a, a, a pure 111 uh, polar phase oriented, um, in particular, um, if uh, grown under tensile strain, um, there is a tendency to stabilize the monoclinic or the tetragonal nonpolar phases, while uh, in, the, um, uh, in, in materials with more compressive strain, um, where the, um, the uh, preferred 111 orientation of the nanoparticles of hafnia, this is something I forgot to say, and naturally hafnia and zirconia nanoparticles tend to prefer the 111 orientation. So when a strain is not in the way and the 111 uh, orientation of uh, natural orientation of the particles um, uh, determines the growth, then and the polar one, uh, the polar phase of hafnia can be created. Why is all uh, this good? Because this control allows us to make very good devices. And so we have made really uh, yeah, extraordinary uh, tunnel junctions with uh, hafnia zirconia layers that are only two nanometers uh, thick. And the, the devices are complicated, um, but basically the junctions are between a, a bottom electrode of, of a, a, a lanthanum strontium manganite, a ferromagnet, and a top electrode of cobalt um, gold. Um, you can see here, they really work like a tunnel junctions and you can see the difference between a two nanometer thick barrier and a three nanometer uh, thick barrier. A three nanometer hafnia layer uh, is so uh, insulating that, uh, that you, you cannot uh, measure the current anymore. Um, so this is a huge advantage of having materials like hafnia with a much larger um, band gap uh, uh, than, than normal ferroelectrics. Um, so, these this, uh, ultra thin two nanometer films are still ferroelectric. They still show the typical characteristics of, of ferroelectric switching in, in the material. And when we uh, put them in, the, in this uh, uh, ferroman in between these two ferromagnetic electrodes, we can measure the, the, the TMR effect in, in these materials. And you can see very uh, nice uh, low noise uh, TMR lo uh, loops. Um, uh, and uh, the magnetization that corresponds to the switching of the different layers. Um, if now we use the fact that our tunnel barrier is a ferroelectric, we can actually switch the polarization of the ferroelectric and we apply uh, here uh, six volts to switch the polarization down and uh, minus six volts to switch the polarization up. And uh, these differences in polarization are known to also bring differences in the barrier uh, uh, height, in the average barrier height, 
and that's a well-known effect and that is uh, bringing uh, differences in resistance of uh, the tunnel junction. And you can see then that by these uh, two effects, the TMR and, and this uh, uh, tunneling electroresistance effect of the ferroelectric switching, we can have four resistance states in our tunnel barrier, which is already a, a very nice result. However, uh, here you see the, the four different resistance states. However, one surprise that we, uh, that, that we had is that when you overlap these two TMR loops, you see that they're nearly identical. So, so this means that the, the effect of the polarization uh, is, is basically zero on the, on the TMR. So they, there's no magnetoelectric coupling uh, as we would expect in a ferroelectric uh, or in a multiferroic uh, tunnel junction. Uh, here is, is the definition of the TEMR effect, this magnetoelectric coupling, as uh, defined in this paper by Garcia and, and co worker. So the TMR with voltage up, uh, with, with polarization up, and the TMR with polarization down, this didn't seem to change. Um, so we did. Uh, yeah, there um, is five yes? minutes left. Five minutes okay. left. Okay. Yes, thank you. So, so we uh, we did some cycling in this uh, in these tunnel junctions, and I have to say that these tunnel junctions are, are very robust um, in in the sense that from from device to device, uh, uh, all the devices in 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 the, in the uh, made in, in a film actually work, uh, and the the results uh, are very similar in all the devices. Uh, but you can see um, things happening after electric cycling, and um, depending on the amount of cycles that we have uh, subjected the, the, the tunnel junction to, we are calling uh, different stage, stage A and B and C. Uh, stage A is the original stage in which that I just explained um, uh, at the beginning of, of, of the cycling of, of the sample, but then if you uh, keep on cycling, you go into a complete different behavior. And uh, at some point, after enough uh, electric field cycling with the same voltage, you can see that uh, you have a huge, a, a huge effect in the TMR. You have a reversal of the TMR effect. So um, we were worried that we didn't have a, a magnetoelectric coupling, but we actually have a huge coupling uh, after cycling. Um, and this uh, becomes uh, weaker, but still present in uh, when we further cycle the samples to a stage C. And these, these changes are actually concomitant with changes in the uh, tunneling electroresistance effect. You can see that this tunneling electroresistance effect, the change in resistance with polarization up and down, was not very much in stage A, but actually increases very much to uh, 10 to the 4% uh, in a stage B, and it reaches even 10 to the 6% in a stage C. So a huge change in between the low resistance state and the high resistance state of the tunnel junction after cycling. So um, uh, also similar effects have been found. Uh, uh, very, very large changes in electroresistance have been found by the group of uh, Ignacy Fina, uh, Joseph von Coberta, in a, at the EMAC, um, in a different way, they find um, a region at low voltages, um, uh, a, a part particular voltages where this electroresistance effect is, is particularly large. And they um, uh, explain this as um, the um, coexistence of two effects, the, a part that is uh, polarization mediated uh, due to the uh, ferroelectric nature of the material, but also the influence of ionic mi migration in the, in the material. Um, in our case, uh, seems, things seem to be a bit different. And we notice that from stage A to stage C, the resistance versus temperature of our junctions are, is completely different. This um, particular shape uh, um, is well known to be due to the LSMO uh, electrode. Uh, the typical resistance versus temperature and behavior of, of the LSMO. And you can see that, that the bottom electrode is changing in between stage A and C. And, and this particular uh, shift of the resistance of the LSMO is indicative of the fact that in stage C, we are creating uh, oxygen vacancies at the LSMO. Uh, if we stay in stage C, uh, then the, the 
there is also a difference in the high resistance state and the low resistance state. You can see that the maximum resistance is shifting um, from 100 uh, Kelvin to 300 Kelvin. So it's clear that you, we have less oxygen vacancies in the LSMO in the low resistance state. All this brings us to propose uh, the following model. Um, in the original growth state, uh, there are oxygen vacancies both in the hafnia layer and in the LSMO layer. And in the uh, high resistance state, by going from stage A through cycling to stage C, all the oxygen vacancies are pushed because of the polarity of the field into the LSMO. And by changing the polarity, uh, the vacancies are, are pushed back into the uh, hafnia. And this is creating these very different and uh, resistant states in hafnia. Now, uh, what is this also can explain the spin polarization reversal because uh, we know that this can have two origins. First of all, change at the cobalt interface, which can, can be also due to these oxygen vacancies in the hafnia layer that also uh, change the cobalt, but also one can have resonant tunneling uh, due to uh, through oxygen vacancies, which is also consistent with this model. Um, by now we have a, a, a better picture that this is the correct um, by microscopy, um, but the paper is not out yet, so I will not say a, a lot more about this. So I would like to conclude by saying that um, it, one has, has to find a very fine balance of many different effects to succeed stabilizing the orthorhombic phase, the polar phase in hafnia. And this has been happening, this has happened by, by chance and, and luckily, um, uh, and we now can benefit from, from that. Um, there is this uh, rhombohedral polar phase, that, which is a higher energy phase that can be stabilized by epitaxial strain and uh, has, a, has a very uh, good interface with uh, the substrate and therefore is very uh, convenient and, and uh, advantageous for, for device applications, um, uh, also because it has a very large uh, polarization. The multiferroic tunnel junctions made with this uh, rhombohedral phase show four resistance states and uh, exceptional uniformity and reproducibility all the two nanometer devices work. And the cycling leads to reversal of TMR effect and a 10 to the four enhancements of the uh, tunneling electroresistance effect of the material. We see that oxygen migration within the tunnel junction is responsible for those changes. So still questions remain. Why there is no magnetoelectric coupling on, on a ferroelectric tunnel junction and still, why is the permittivity so low? These questions still need to be, uh, to be answered, but I have uh, some information I cannot tell you, and I, I would like mm -hmm. you to stay tuned to um, a paper that is going to appear in Science in, on September 11th, so very close, um, that I believe is going to, uh, to answer some of these questions. Not all, because we still need to, to work more on this material. But um, I hope this gives you a, um, a feeling on how important uh, this material is, how exciting this moment is uh, in which we are learning how to deal with uh, this interesting system and, uh, and how much potential it has for applications in the future. And thank you uh, for your attention. Well, I clapped for everyone. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, I have a, a question in the chat. Uh, is there a microscopic understanding on why a uh, hafnia and uh, zirconia are ferroelectric? In other words, if I were to look for ferroelectricity, which compounds shall I look at? Yeah, so there is, uh, it's true that we cannot look uh, at this material, well, we can look at these materials now with, with uh, electron microscopy. We can see that these materials are indeed polar. Um, so that is indeed the microscopic understanding. You need a polar material, you need a material without, uh, without inversion center. Um, now, in order for the material to be ferroelectric, you still need that this material can be switched by electric field. And that's not uh, uh, happening in all polar materials. But indeed, the first thing you need to look for is a polar material, a material with a polar space group. So uh, a crystal structure uh, that doesn't have inversion center. Mm -hmm. Well, that question uh, was from uh, Guan Se Chen. And there is another question from uh, Beck von Kuberta. Uh, what is known about the role of surface energy on the stabilization of the rhombohedral phase? Yeah, so um, that's a very interesting question. 
Um, we, uh, we think that it must have a very important role, probably uh, similar to the orthorhombic phase, because we see the same effect that uh, above 10 nanometer, the films become a mixed phase. So uh, um, if, if the films are, are too large, and of course, the thickness of the film is correlated to the size of the grains that, that you form. So grains above 10 nanometers uh, are difficult to stabilize in single phase rhombohedral. So it must have a, an important effect. Um, yeah, so maybe that's, that's the answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is uh, another question by uh, Philippe saint uh, Is there any knowledge on the stability of these metastable polar phases in the presence of oxygen, oxygen vacancies? Yeah, that's a very good question. I couldn't talk about this. There are a couple of papers coming from uh, from my group about this, and I think others have also uh, also investigated that. Um, it, with respect to, to the, the concrete, um, I don't dare to say much about the orthorhombic phase, um, but for the stabilization of the rhombohedral phase, we believe that oxygen vacancies are important, and it may have to do with with the volume changes that are needed. Um, so, so we do think that the rhombohedral phase is stabilized thanks to oxygen vacancies in the material. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So while we wait for more questions, uh, I, just a question that uh, I don't know. Maybe it's a little, a little naive. I don't know. But uh, you can stabilize. You have ferroelectricity in very, very um, thin layers. Does it mean also that you can draw very small uh, ferroelectric domains? Uh, on the surface compared um, to others, to other ferroelectrics? Um, well, you artificially you can uh, um, you, you can choose the size of, of your uh, of, of your domains if, if the material is stable. But indeed, the natural domains that are formed in the material in order to avoid depolarization fields, for example, um, those are correlated to the size of the uh, to the thickness of the material. So if you have a very thin film, the domains that will form naturally uh, mm -hmm. to avoid depolarization fields will be also very small. Okay. Yes. Okay. So you can actually get uh, a, a very small uh, yes. domains, uh, so very large miniaturization. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, okay. So another question maybe uh, related to the, to the LSMO. I mean, what is the, um, the role there is because it's very easy to uh, provide uh, oxygen vacancies, or is that is that the main role there? Uh, well, uh, th this is a very very good question. Um, there, we are working on this. We have a paper in preparation about that. Um, it, it is a combined effect of the strain and the oxygen vacancies. Um, mm -hmm. Again, it may be different from the orthorhombic phase and the rhombohedral phase. But, um, and, and it depends on, on the effect you want to see if you are talking about the stabilization of the ferroelectric phase or the uh, generation of the TR effect, for example, then, then the effect is different. But indeed, uh, to have LSMO under tensile strain um, itself that, that is able to generate oxygen vacancies um, to, to, uh, to the, mm -hmm. and, and to move the oxygen vacancies into the hafnia seems to be a very important uh, uh, very important, uh, yeah. Effect, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, Need thank you. Uh, we have another question by Akash uh, Badnagar. Uh, analogous to thin ferroelectrics, are fractal also domains visible? Um, well, we haven't seen uh, domains um, in, uh, in Hafnia. I don't think a lot of people have seen domains, uh, natural domains in Hafnia, but indeed, uh, fractal uh, domains um, are forming in ferroelectrics. In Havnia, it's difficult to observe them. As you say, the natural domains would be very small. Uh, they would be very difficult to observe. Um, and uh, well, I, I showed a, a, um, a slide uh, on artificial domains. Those, those are typically large because you made them with the tip of an AFM, so you don't mm -hmm. have the... Um, the possibility to, to then observe the naturally formed fractals. Mm -hmm. Another question from Marta Galbiati. Uh, very nice talk, <laughs> she says. Yeah, uh, what do you think about the potential of ferroelectric 2D materials? Well, I think it's huge. Um, and um, yeah, so in this case, typically the polarization is in, uh, is, is in the plane. So you don't have these issues of the polarization field. 
Um, I think they have a great potential because, of course, you can uh, combine them with uh, topological insulators and with uh, many other different uh, uh, um, functionalities in, in, in a heterostructure. Um, so I, I think it's a very, uh, we are going to hear a lot about these materials. Mm -hmm. So from uh, Gabriele De Luca, uh, we have, uh, do you see a correlation between ferroelectric properties in uh, Hafnia's uh, Zirconia and its growth mode? Growth mode? Um, yes, um, I'm sure there are. We have not done that systematically. Um, but, uh, but of course, you need to keep uh, the particle size small. So normally in, in, in an epitaxial oxide, we do a lot of effort to investigate the growth mode. And we try to, uh, to grow layer by layer um, uh, and, uh, and as, as, as uh, flat as possible, as atomically flat as possible. But in Hafnia, this doesn't work because you really need to keep the size of uh, the, the grain size small. Uh, so, so nucleating uh, particles in, in the substrate, it works better, actually. Um, so we have not yet have the chance to, to investigate uh, very much what will happen if uh, the material will, be, will grow um, um, atomically flat um, or change uh, different growth modes, because there's not so much freedom you have in terms of, of uh, getting a, a polar material you need a very particular conditions to get the material to be polar after growth. Mm -hmm. uh, Juan Beltran uh, asks, uh, how do the oxygen partial pressure influence the polarization exhibited in this system? Um, it's, uh, it does. Uh, you need to, um, um, it does, but it's not key. I mean, if I compare with, with other materials like the nickelase that we are also growing in the lab or, or any other uh, perovskite material that we are growing in the lab, then it's very, uh, very oh, spinels, for example. It's very cri critical, the, the oxygen pressure during growth and also the oxygen pressure during cooling down. Um, Hafnia, once we have found the growth conditions, uh, the oxygen pressure is not, is not key. Um, you need enough oxidation, but as I said before, it could be that the rhombohedral phase requires a little bit of oxygen vacancies. Um, we have not yet done the systematic study that we have done, for example, with, with nickelase or with other oxides uh, to, uh, to, to investigate the uh, exact values of polarization as a function of oxygen pressure. Um, but I can say that to get the right phase, at least to get the right phase, uh, the um, the exact oxygen pressure window is not so critical as for bismuth ferrite or mm -hmm. for uh, the nickelates. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, we have a question uh, by someone I don't know who uh, he is uh, or she. Um, why do you attribute the change in spin polarization to the cobalt interface and not um, to the LSMO? who subject yes. to strong steric pressure changes due to the vacancy pumping. Um, yeah, so, so the particular changes um, that we see have been earlier uh, associated to in other tunnel junctions with uh, STO tunnel junctions, I believe with cobalt. Um, people have observed similar uh, TMR reversal. So that's why we thought it could be uh, related to cobalt. Uh, I believe in the group of Thales, uh, Agnes Barcelemi and uh, Manuel Vives and collaborators, they have shown, if I remember correctly, tunnel junctions with STO and cobalt showing similar effect. And they have uh, at that time reported that it was in, uh, uh, not the, the LSMO, but the cobalt. Um, so that's one reason. And the other reason is I didn't show it here, but, but we actually saw on TM that the cobalt is oxidized at the interface. Um, so that, that can happen. So oxygen vacancies move, uh, oxygen moves really uh, all through and, uh, and the electrodes are, um, yeah, there is a lot of exchange at the electrodes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I don't see more questions. So if you want to ask a question, you have uh, like one minute. <laughs> and yeah, um, okay, yeah, another one. Akash Badnagar, uh, is there information regarding the number of voltage cycles uh, before fatigue sets in? 
Yeah, that's a good uh, question. Uh, so I didn't say anything because it depends very much, especially on the surface of our our junctions on, on our devices. Um, so our devices are like uh, 30 microns by 30 microns, but uh, we also uh, um, tested uh, 10 microns. And uh, it, it depends um, the, um, the number of cycles that they can uh, withstand until they go to stage C. It depends very much on the on the surface area, and uh, it goes from a few tens to two hundred, and depending on on the material, but that is not optimized uh, uh, depending on the on the device, but um, that is not optimized yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, it's been a very good, a good talk. Um, uh, well, uh, Julia Herrero says thank you, Beatriz. Uh, great talk as always. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, now if uh, you stay with us and activate your camera, we can take a group picture. So I need okay. Beatriz to unshare the screen. Stop sharing. Yes. So I can take a picture of everyone. All good. Okay, we have a few pages, so you have to stay with me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, we take so cheese like a smile. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> one. I go to the second one. <laughs> okay, smile. Good. <laughs> okay, okay, that's it. Because uh, we don't have more cameras. I guess that people are shy. <laughs> okay, okay. So thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. And I thank clap you. for everyone. And I. Thank you. Yeah, you can bye bye. you can unmute yourselves if you want <laughs> and clap. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you, Beatriz. Beatriz. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so um, don't forget that we have uh, now two seminary talks. Okay. <laughs> so let's see you in like fifteen minutes or so. Thank yes. you. Bye. 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 Okay, Beatriz, I will send you the pictures. <laughs> um, muchas, muchas gracias. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>